going to wrap up our discussion today of the problem of evil and suffering. And I initiated this problem by saying that there are really two versions. There's the intellectual version of the problem of suffering, which comes in both a logical and a probabilistic form. And then there's what we could call the emotional problem of evil. And I've argued over the last couple weeks that the intellectual problem of evil ultimately fails. That the atheist is unable to show that the evil and suffering in the world is either inconsistent with or improbable with respect to God's existence. And that therefore the intellectual version of the problem of evil fails. Now before we go on to discuss the emotional version of the problem of evil, let me just ask if there's any final discussion that you would like to have about the intellectual version in its various forms. Now, I indicated that I think for most people the problem of suffering and evil is not really an intellectual problem. It's really an emotional problem. They've never really thought very deeply about this problem, but they just emotionally react to God's permitting the terrible evil and suffering in the world. So we need to address this emotional problem. Now, you might be thinking, well, then why go through all of this intellectual uh, material uh, if this is really just an emotional problem? Well, I think there are two reasons why it's important to have dealt with this intellectually. First, people think that their problem is intellectual. And so by working through the intellectual problem of evil, we can show respect for their opinion uh, and try to help them to see what the real problem is. We take their objections and uh, arguments at face value and deal with them intellectually. But secondly, I think also that what we've seen can be of tremendous help to us when we are called upon to go through suffering. The health and wealth gospel uh, and the gospel of positive thinking that is preached in so many mega churches and denominations uh, in the United States are simply false gospels. And they set people up for a fall. They cannot make sense of terrible, apparently pointless suffering entering in your life, uh, and therefore are setting people up for tremendous doubt and perhaps abandonment of their faith when they encounter that sort of suffering. And it's very obvious that these are false gospels because that sort of a health and wealth prosperity gospel won't preach in Iraq or in Syria or North Korea or a thousand other places. And if it won't preach there, then it's not the true gospel. We need to understand that God's plan for human history may involve terrible suffering for us whose point or reason we may not be able to see. Indeed, we cannot expect to see it. Our hope is not in worldly happiness, but rather in that day when we go to be with God and He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. So, what can be said to folks who are struggling with the emotional problem of suffering? Well, in one sense, the most important thing may not be what you say at all. For many people, I think the important thing is that you, are, are, you just be there as a sympathetic listener, as a loving friend who cares about them. Uh, you don't need to have all of the answers. They may simply need someone who, who understands, who sympathizes with them, and gives them a shoulder to cry on. But still, there will be people who need counsel. And we ourselves may need to deal with the emotional problem of evil when we go through suffering. So what does the Christian faith have to say 
uh, to deal with this problem as well. Well, it tells us that God is not some sort of distant creator or impersonal ground of being. Rather, it tells us that God is a loving heavenly Father who shares our hurts and who suffers along with us. On the cross, Christ endured a suffering of which we can literally form no conception whatsoever because he endured the punishment or penalty for the sin of the whole world. Even though he was perfectly innocent, he voluntarily took upon himself the consequences for the sin of the entire world that we deserve. None of us can comprehend that suffering. Even though he was innocent, he voluntarily took upon himself incomprehensible suffering for our sake. And why did he do this? Simply because he loves us so much. To bring us back to a relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. How can we reject him who was willing to give up everything for us? And so when God asks you to go through suffering that seems pointless, unnecessary, or unmerited, I think that meditation upon the wounds of Christ can help to give us the moral strength and the courage that we need to bear the cross that we are asked to carry through life. Don't torture yourself trying to figure out why God is permitting you to go through that suffering. As I said, given our cognitive limitations, we shouldn't be able uh, to expect to perceive the reasons for which God is allowing that suffering to enter your life. The British theologian J.I. Packer uh, calls this the York signal box mistake. Packer says that in the city of York in England there is a great train yard uh, filled with uh, tracks that have sh shuntings off to the side, sidings and so forth, and the tracks are controlled or the trains are controlled by a signal box that is in a tower over the entire train yards in York. Now to someone who is in the signal box, he can see on a lighted electronic map the little glowing worms of the various trains and why one is shunted onto a siding there, why another train is pulled over here. It can all make sense to someone in the signal box. But to someone down on the tracks, it's utterly incomprehensible why these trains are moving all about him the way they are and why they're being uh, shunted in the ways that they are. It would be incomprehensible to the person down on the tracks. And what Packer says that when it comes to the evil and suffering in our lives, for better or worse, we're not in God's signal box. We can't see the big perspective. We're down on the tracks. And therefore, when we try to figure out why God allows us to suffer in a certain way, we are presuming to be in his position, in the signal box, and we're not there. Rather than try to figure out why God is allowing you to suffer in this way, you should simply ask him to give you the strength and the courage to bear the suffering that Christ has called upon uh, you to bear, and to see what lessons um, you might learn out of this. I mentioned earlier in our study that the knowledge of God is an incommensurable good to which our suffering cannot even be uh, compared. To know God, to come into relationship with Him is a good which is literally incomparable to the suffering that we undergo. Few of us, I think, really understand this truth. But I had a colleague um, when I taught at Westmont College who got to know a woman who did understand this. He used to make it uh, a practice of his to visit shut-ins in nursing homes in the community in an attempt to bring some bit of cheer and love into their lives. 
And one Mother's Day, he was visiting a nursing home in which he met a woman whom he would never forget. And this is his account of that woman and that friendship. He says, on this particular day, I was walking in a hallway that I had not visited before, looking in vain for a few who were alive enough to receive a flower and a few words of encouragement. This hallway seemed to contain some of the worst cases, strapped onto carts or into wheelchairs and looking completely helpless. As I neared the end of this hallway, I saw an old woman strapped in a wheelchair. Her face was an absolute horror. The empty stare and white pupils of her eyes told me that she was blind. The large hearing aid over one ear told me that she was almost deaf. One side of her face was being eaten by cancer. There was a discolored and running sore covering part of one cheek and it had pushed her nose to the side, dropped one eye, and distorted her jaw so that what should have been the corner of her mouth was the bottom of her mouth. As a consequence, she drooled constantly. I also learned later that this woman was 89 years old and that she had been bedridden, blind, nearly deaf, and alone for 25 years. This was Mabel. I don't know why I spoke to her. She looked less likely to respond than most of the people I saw in that hallway. But I put a flower in her hand and said, here's a flower for you. Happy Mother's Day. She held the flower up to her face and tried to smell it. And then she spoke. And much to my surprise, her words, though somewhat garbled because of her deformity, were obviously produced by a clear mind. She said, thank you. It's lovely, but can I give it to someone else? I can't see it, you know. I'm blind. I said, of course, and pushed her in her chair back down the hallway to a place where I thought I could find some alert patients. I found one, and I stopped the chair. Mabel held out the flower and said, here, this is from Jesus. That was when it began to dawn on me that this was not an ordinary human being. Mabel and I became friends over the next few weeks, and I went to see her once or twice a week for the next three years. It was not many weeks before I turned from a sense that I was being helpful to a sense of wonder, and I would go to her with a pen and paper and write down the things she would say. During one hectic week of final exams, I was frustrated because my mind seemed to be pulled in ten directions at once with all of the things that I had to think about. The question occurred to me, what does Mabel have to think about? Hour after hour, day after day, week after week, not even able to know if it's day or night. So I went to her and asked, Mabel, what do you think about as you lie here? And she said, I think about my Jesus. I sat there and thought for a moment about the difficulty for me of thinking about Jesus for even five minutes. And I asked, what do you think about Jesus? She replied slowly and deliberately as I wrote, and this is what she said. I think how good he's been to me. He's been awfully good to me in my life, you know. I'm one of those kind who's mostly satisfied. Lots of folks would think I'm kind of old-fashioned, but I don't care. I'd rather have Jesus. He's all the world to me. And then Mabel began to sing an old hymn. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. This is not 
fiction. Incredible as it may seem, a human being really lived like this. I know. I knew her. How could she do it? Seconds ticked and minutes crawled, and so did days and weeks and months and years of pain without human company and without an explanation of why it was all happening. And she lay there and sang hymns. How could she do it? The answer, I think, is that Mabel had something that you and I don't have much of. She had power. Lying there in that bed, unable to move, unable to see, unable to hear, unable to talk to anyone, she had incredible power. What an amazing testimony. Paradoxically, even though the problem of suffering is the greatest obstacle to belief in God's existence, at the end of the day, God is the only solution to the problem of evil. If God does not exist, then we are locked without hope in a world filled with pointless and gratuitous suffering. God is the final answer to the problem of suffering, for he redeems us from evil and he takes us into the everlasting joy of an incommensurable good, which is fellowship with himself. Well, that's what I wanted to share about the emotional problem of suffering and evil. Uh, does anyone have any reaction or discussion of that problem? It sounds like Mabel was uh, highly spiritually mature because um, I've, I've noticed that uh, even in my own personal life, when when conflict comes, the, the first thing you do is panic. You you wonder what you know what you're doing wrong. How can you fix it? Like uh, Thomas mentioned in the sermon, you know, did I pray long enough? Did I did I have I given enough quiet time? And so we, because of the, the pain is hard, whatever it is, a physical ailment, you've lost a job, you've lost a relative, whatever it is, you 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 wonder why God is is coming at you, you think, okay, did I do something wrong? You know, yeah. especially if somebody's lost a child, they wonder if they were bad parents or if they've done something where they deserve that, yeah. you know, because there are Old Testament verses, at least, that seem like your your happiness is right in line with whether or not you're good to God. Obviously, the New Testament, you know, it's it's different, you know, with all the... with all the Yeah, uh, don't forget that the book of Job is sure, found sure. in the Old Testament. Right. Oh, no, I'm not, I, I, I didn't say the whole Old Testament. No. I'm just saying some of, you know, Proverbs says if, if, if you yeah. give your life to God, basically that, that, that he'll direct your steps and you'll be successful and so on and so forth. But, uh, but I, I agree that, that you can focus on God. There, I think there's adages that talk about, uh, talk about you, instead of looking at how big your problem is, look at how big your God is. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's, it takes time to get to Mabel's level, but yes, if we could, if we could learn to just dig our heels in and just say, God, okay, whatever you're doing here, let me help me to get through it, or whatever you're doing to my friend, help me to just be there for them. Yeah, I, I think if we just focus on Him, that that's what we need to do. But it is, it is hard. You you yeah. do panic and you try to run from the pain. You try to figure out how any way to get rid of it and just move on with your life. But sometimes God is just trying to change your life. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes, Patrick. Well, something that struck me about Mabel's story was when he said she had power. Yeah. And I started thinking about other people that I've known in very unfortunate conditions. And they seem, and I can't prove it, this isn't any kind of logical proof of any kind, but I, they always seem joyful. It seems like they've been given a grace that we can't have, that they have been given a gift that we would could only imagine if, even if we were in their situation, we wouldn't necessarily have it, but those people seem to be almost specifically chosen to be infused with a grace hmm. that gives them a joy that we can't understand. When you see yeah. the Downs child, always happy, full of love. I've never seen a miserable Downs person. Hmm. They're always happy. Yeah. Why? 
and they're, they Paul, don't know they're miserable. Paul suffered from a terrible physical infirmity that he asked God to remove three times, he says. He prayed God would remove it. And God's answer to him was, my power is made perfect in weakness. And you see that illustrated in Mabel's life, I think, so beautifully. Right. Um, so Paul says, I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses, because when I am weak, then I'm strong. Yeah, it just seems like that God infuses the weak yeah. with his power. Yeah. And that's where we get that. Yeah. Okay, any other response? Yes. And thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, story. Um, I the the story very much reminded me of uh, a great American saint, uh, Fanny Crosby, who was born uh, blind and, uh, or at least was blind at a very young age, and uh, became, uh, I think, one of the greatest hymn writers uh, of all time. Um, mm -hmm. Blessed assurance, all the way my Savior leads me, um, and um, has written, you know, along these lines, you know, s some of the similar things that Mabel shared. Um, I think just in the way that uh, the disciples' lives are, are this powerful testimony and evidence for the Christian faith, so to the testimony of the great saints yeah. are a powerful yeah. evidence for yeah. Amen. the Christian faith. Thank you. George. Uh, Bill, could you comment on whether you think the book of Job is historical or an exten oh. extended parable? Yeah, I, I don't know, George. I've never studied it. So I, as a lay person, I, I've never looked into it. I, I, would, I wouldn't have a problem if it were a fictitious story um, that was meant to illustrate a, a point. Um, but in the absence of any reason to think that, uh, I think one can take it as historical. I've just never explored that. Well, the one issue that bothers me if you try to take it as history, is it says that Job had 10 children, they were all killed, and Job was tested, and he lost all of his property. And at the end of the book, his fortunes are restored yes. twofold, and he has another set of children. But the original children are gone, you know. They're not, they don't return. And if you take it as history, it seems like that's not really a restoration of his fortunes in the sense of losing those children. That, that causes me pause to take it as history. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, maybe what that might cause you to question is not so much the historicity of it, but perhaps the Jewish value system that is expressed there, that if a man loses some of his family and then God gives him twice as large a family for an ancient Jew that might be thought to have your fortunes restored, uh, that that is exactly what, in a Jewish culture that valued family, one would mean by having your fortunes restored. So we got to recognize that we're dealing with ancient cultures here that may be very different than our modern cultures in terms of their values. Um, and I think that would need to be considered as well. Uh, I just have a quick comment. Thank you again. That was an incredible story. Um, I was struck by the word, you know, at the end that it showed incredible power. The word I expected was faith or strength. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, power to me means someone's got control over other people or things and mm -hmm. here's this helpless person so I'm still kind of struck by that word <laughs> yes it's a tremendous paradox isn't it and I think he's right in choosing it uh, he could have said she had great faith but it, he didn't he, he chose to say that this seemingly helpless invalid had in fact tremendous power much greater power than we who are well seem to exhibit so I like the choice of words that he gave. Yeah, Brad. <clears throat> I think uh, at, also in, in the case of Job, we, we have to have a perspective that is not of this world, that's of eternity. 
And yes, indeed, those those children are gone. They're better than Job. Right, they're better off. <laughs> you know, they're better off than Job. And I think, you know, all of the people of the Old Testament are, are dead. All of the people born before uh, 19, or 1850 are dead. They're all dead. And, and so part of what we have to look at, I think, with suffering is not this world, but eternity. Yeah. And, and it's hard to do because that's God's perspective. Yeah. And I think that's uh, another thing that we have to think about in terms of suffering. Absolutely. That that's during this world, there's a broader perspective that's very difficult for us to uh, 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 understand. Yeah, I, I think Brad's making a good point. Uh, when we dealt with the probabilistic version of the problem of evil, you'll recall I mentioned that one of the Christian doctrines is that this life isn't all there is that this life spills over into eternal life. And when you view our suffering in the perspective of eternity, it's infinitesimal by comparison with the time we'll spend with God in eternity. But I think what Brad is pointing out here is that this also goes some distance for dealing with the emotional problem of evil. If you can live in light of eternity and keep your eyes fixed on that, that will help to give you the strength to endure the suffering that we go through now. So that this point is not only intellectually relevant, but it is, I think you're right, emotionally uh, important as well. Yes, Stephanie. Um, I want to go back to the power, the word power. One of the things that I run into as a doctoral student at Georgia State is this whole idea of, you know, only white men have power in this oh. country. Um, <laughs> It's an urban university. It's a research university. Yeah, I mean, so so it's very much a worldly mindset. They would not look at Babel and say, "Oh, yeah, that's power." And I think part of what we need to do as believers is to retake the word power hmm. and attribute it back to what the word actually means. I mean, power is not I get to boss you around, although people in their sin natures have taken it to do that. But power means enabled by God to persevere. Yeah. And I think we've lost sight of that as yeah. well. Well said. Thank you, Stephanie. Anyone else? Yeah, Taylor over here. Um, hello, Dr. Craig. Uh, you said that this was uh, the response to the emotional problem of evil. Yes. Are we going to be continuing on with other discussions? I feel like my no. I be... think that this is sufficient for dealing with the emotional okay. problem then, of evil. Okay, then then I better ask the question now. Um, so, uh, a book that was written, I think, relatively recently by um, uh, uh, Bart Ehrman, the uh, yeah. about the problem of evil. I was wondering if you could. Uh, respond to something like that? Uh, were you saying that these issues dealt in the Bible are actually saying that, oh, well, you're supposed to respond to the problem of evil this way, and then another part of the Bible, it says that you should respond to the problem of evil yeah. by saying that? I haven't read Bart Ehrman's okay. book on the problem of evil because I don't think it's likely that a New Testament scholar who has no training in this area would have much uh, insight into the philosophical questions related to the intellectual problem of evil. I think it is very interesting, though, that Ehrman's abandonment of the Christian faith, he said, really had nothing to do with biblical inerrancy or his finding errors in the, in the Gospels or his work as a New Testament scholar, where he is trained and where he is expert. He's a textual critic uh, on the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. There wasn't anything in that that apparently led to an insuperable obstacle to Christian faith. It was these philosophical questions related to the problem of evil that caused him to lose his faith. And I, for one, find that tremendously paradoxical because it, it wasn't something in his area of expertise that challenged him and made his lose his faith. It was in something on which he hasn't studied, he is an expert. And I, I would simply say that the responses to the intellectual problem of suffering that I've given, I think, are thoroughly biblical um, and are good responses to the, the probabilistic version. Okay. Yeah, um, Did you have something specific in mind? Uh, yeah, you, I think you, his argument was that each one of these examples of how, like, let's say you're sinning, or you're, you're 
sin has caused this evil to happen to you uh-huh. is is one response but then another place it will say it's not that right um he'll say that these are two separate accounts that are contradictory the bible contradicts itself uh-huh. rather than a, a different scenarios can have different explanations would you i, I was just wondering if you yeah i think that, that yeah. again that will be a question for the consistency of biblical theology, not the adequacy of the answer to the problem of suffering and evil. It seems to me that what I've said about those four Christian doctrines that greatly increase the probability of evil and suffering if the Christian God exists are all biblical um, and that they show that it really isn't surprising that the world would be filled with moral and natural suffering um, if Christianity is true. And so I, would, I take that to be an adequate response to the problem of suffering and evil from a biblical point of view. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, what I'm seeing, and, and help me through this, is given that we're in a secular world and also academia is so liberal, um, the most of those saying... Uh, I can't believe in God because of the evils and the suffering in the world, and no loving God would allow that. Right? <laughs> yes, uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Sure. Um, but I don't, I think they stop there because they don't want to really, they're not really searching. It's more um, that they want to prove to themselves that God does not exist and they're not responsible to. A God, so that it seems to them that you can't have an all-loving God and have suffering. Um, and 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 then as we studied this, which we had to delve into to to create some logic behind that statement, that most do not want to go that far. If right. I'm if I I'm correct, yeah. and, and it does take a little bit. Uh, I mean, I can understand a human being being evil and causing suffering on another human being, I think the real hang-up is, let's take your example of the little girl caught in the rubble where there's no apparent good news, you know, or greater good. Um, And I think those kinds of sufferings, it just stops short. I mean, it is kind of difficult to walk someone through to get them to a point where they can comprehend that a loving God allows evil and suffering. Uh Uh, Well, Cindy, I guess the question is, is this this an intellectual problem that that is being raised here? If it is, then I would just go back through the points that I made about how we're not in a position to say when some natural evil occurs that God probably doesn't have a morally sufficient reason for allowing that. Give some illustrations like from chaos theory, popular culture, to make the point, and then make the other points that that I've made as well. I mean, it's all just going through the same material over again. If this is an emotional problem that they're having, then again, I think one would um, point to Christ to God and how he was willing to bear suffering for them of which they can form no comprehension. So why would they reject him uh, when he was willing to go through hell in order to save them? Um, So one would just need to go through these issues again with a person and, and hopefully that person will be open. Truly open. And not just argumentative. Yeah. All right, well, let's close then with a benediction and uh, bring our class to an end. And now may the omnipotent God who spoke the worlds into being give you power to live your life in confidence, in courage, in faith, no matter what suffering or evil might enter your experience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.